pagtatanghal. Ang ating pagtitipon ngayong araw ay nagpapakita ng ating pagkakaisa at pag-asa para sa mas maayos na kinabukasan ng bawat Pilipinong mag-aaral. Ngayon, narito tayo upang muli nating marinig at masaksihan ang mga inisatibang nagpaangat sa kalidad ng edukasyon ng ating bansa. Kaya't maraming maraming salamat po Kalihim Leonor Magtolis Briones sa inyong dedikasyon at pagsisikap sa pagpapatupad ng pangarap ng bawat batang Pilipino. Pakinggan po natin ngayon ang outgoing Secretary of the Department of Education and Professor Emeritus Leonor Magtolis Briones. Kindly uh, sit down, please. To quote, to quote from the good book, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. We say hello and goodbye. Hello to our beloved Secretary of Education, the Honorable Vice President Zara Z. Duterte. And to say goodbye to the former Secretary of Education. So it's an afternoon of hello and goodbye. I have um, thought very lengthily on what I should uh, entitle my last uh, address to the Department of Education. And it's a great honor to have our Secretary of Education, uh, Inday Sara. And as we were walking down the aisle to this auditorium, and she was holding my hand, and I said to her, remember the first time we met, you were also holding my hand. This was when I attended the June 12th Independence Day celebration in Davao City, and she was then mayor, and I was secretary of education. And we walked together to the plaza, and she held my hand. And that is what working in government, serving the Filipino people is all about. We hold each other's hand. The title of my uh, goodbye, I remember one of the secretaries of education before he passed on to another dimension in his hospital bed, he made a few habilins. And unlike the usual habilins of people who are about to depart, and he was talking to his son, he, was not, he did not talk about how the properties and the children and the grandchildren and the school that they owned should be administered. He was talking and sabing ang title noon. It was featured in one of the newspapers, the last lecture of Secretary so and so. I will not mention his name because I don't have uh, permission from the family. So I thought that I would discuss. I thought that I would share with you my thoughts on passing on the gospel of education. Why gospel? Gospel is a word which is derived from the Anglo-Saxon term, God spell, meaning a good story. 
a rendering of the Latin Evangelium and the Greek Evangelion, meaning good news or good telling. There has been so much moaning and groaning and screaming and shouting about what has been described as a crisis in education, particularly on learning loss in the Philippines. However, when I spoke at the minister's meeting in London before 125 ministers of education, I said we should not only moan and weep about learning loss due to COVID, but we should also celebrate learning gains and victories where we achieve them, especially in a country like the Philippines. And so this afternoon, it's time to share what I see and as I handle and pass on the baton of responsibility to our Secretary of Education. What are the gains that we have achieved even as we had to do battle with COVID-19? And Cambridge University, I had a meeting with them also in London. They told us that learning loss is not a blanket term. We are compared to countries in other, com in other continents. We are compared to other continents as well in Europe and the United States and Canada and Australia. But different demographics experience loss differently. Loss is not just one definition. And we were told, your system is unique. Your solution, whatever challenges we are passing on, should also recognize this. For those who are not very familiar yet with the Department of Education, but I always joke that if we have 100 million Filipinos, you have 100 million experts in education as well. We can talk about geometry, about chemistry, and nobody will argue with you. But you mention education, you mention K-12, and everyone is an expert. Right now, we have 60,428 schools. I stated this to Secretary <clears throat> Sara when we had our transition meeting. We had 28 million learners. We have 28 million learners. Many ministers were complaining and moaning about the fact that enrollments went down even as they fought COVID. In our case, enrollment has gone up. Before COVID, we had 27 million learners. Now we have 28 million learners. And we have the biggest, the largest bureaucracy, bigger than the military, bigger than other ministries and departments. We have one million personnel. And what's more, we have the largest allocation from the national budget, which is 629.8 billion pesos. One of our cabinet members used to joke that I am like a Lola, hindi na mother hen, a Lola hen sitting on top of 630 billion eggs while many others are gazing up and thinking and dreaming and making pasundot sundot at those 620 billion eggs. Now, what were the six-year gains in our fight for accessible quality education, which the Constitution demands of us? One is what we describe as sulung educalidad. The Constitution does not tell us only just to educate our children. Constitution tells us we have to provide quality education. And of course, this is a huge demand. One thing that I did as Secretary of Education 
and all the regional directors, the SDSs, the principals, etc., can attest to this, was I took very, very seriously the policy of regionalization. This is the empowerment of the regions from the central office to the regions where they could make decisions on their own. Each region is a little secretary of education office. Each head of school is a, an, a third level official. Each superintendent, each supervisor contributes to decision making. They don't have, we have general rules, we have guidelines, but they must decide as quickly as possible on the many problems. In the time of COVID, you cannot wait for a circular, you cannot wait for a memorandum, you cannot wait for a, a letter. We text each other. And the test of many of my officials, my former officials, is that they have to choose an office which has very good signal because I have the bad habit of calling them at three o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, midnight, whenever something happens affecting the different regions. A third accomplishment, it's not really an accomplishment, it was more of a, an activity, is our participation in the famous PISA, and this is the international assessment of 15 to 7 year old students <clears throat> all over the world to see how they fare with each other on basic subjects. I had six to seven predecessors from the time that PISA was established. The decision at, in those times was not to participate. I was the first who made the decision that we have to look in the mirror and see how we fare with the others. We had to ask the PISA mirror, PISA, PISA on the wall, who is the brightest, who is the best of us all. But this is not what PISA is all about. It's really an assessment of the capacity of our learners. Another development which we initiated with the help of international partners and um, Secretary Harry is here, and I would like to um, suggest, and also our secretary, Secretary Sara, that if they will visit the National Educators Academy of the Philippines in Baguio, it has been thoroughly reorganized because the most important thing, not really, I will not say the most important thing, but a very important component of education, of course, is the quality and the capacity of our teachers. My favorite, my favorite uh, scientist, uh, he passed on when he was in his 70s. He could hardly speak and he could only um, communicate through a computer. And, but he was perhaps the leading mathematician of his generation. And he said that wherever you have, you stumble on a brilliant student, you can be sure there is a good teacher coaching that brilliant student. You cannot have brilliant students without excellent teachers. And so we are transforming NAYAP into an institution which will respond to the very fast-paced challenges and changes that are going on in education. Another important uh, initiative that we undertook is, you know, ministries of education or other agencies of government, they meet all the time, they compare notes all the time, and perhaps they also gossip all the time. But we discuss curriculum, we discuss books, we discuss toys, we discuss teaching technologies, but we hardly discuss accountability. 
We hardly discuss financial systems. We hardly discuss financial planning. And one major initiative that we undertook was really to, to take very, very good care of the huge budget that has been uh, allocated to us. And so we have made many initiatives here, particularly in the procurement aspect of management. You cannot handle COVID if you don't have a good procurement system. You cannot find solutions. You cannot build laboratories. You cannot distribute vaccines if your system is inefficient. And if accountability is not carefully administered, then you might have a problem. Another aspect which I'm sure you already have a sampling of, and there will be more to come, is that we are always urged, go back to the basic, go to mathematics, go to science, go to engineering, go to accounting, teach your children all this, what they describe as the fundamentals. I agree very strongly that if we teach the basics of mathematics or science already in college, then it is too late. The basics of grammar, you try to teach them at university level, it is already too late. And so therefore, we must not only be good scientists, we must not only be precise in counting, in measuring, in discovering new ways of doing things, but we have to remain human as well. And we don't know how we will look like even as we prepare our learners. Perhaps 30, 50 years from now, we may have blue eyes, one blue eye and another green eye. Maybe we will look different. We're, also, we're already going to be implanting chips in our brains. And right now, we are already in the fashionable habit of, you know, uh, designer babies. And there will be more interesting things to come. But we must remain human. We must remember our history. We must know what we are as a people. And the best way to learn about our history, about our culture, about our story, is through literature, it's through music, it's through poetry. Again, we hear very often, and it is repeated in all the literature and all the newspapers about the state of education, about how poorly we treat our teachers. This was true during my mother's time, or perhaps during the time of uh, the grandmother of our Secretary of Education now. Our teachers are our heroes. I said you cannot have a brilliant student without a really, truly great and patient teacher taking care of that student, mentoring that student. And even as we say that our teachers are underpaid, I'd like to share with you and I have shared this also with Secretary Duterte, the movement of the salaries of our teachers since 2016, when the previous administration took over. You will see in the chart that Teacher One in 2016 started with 19,000. By 2022, it's already 25,000 basic and if you go as high as master teacher and you work hard for your PhD and your master's degree and whatever it is to help uh, promote your professional growth, you can reach as high as 62,449 a month. But we have to remember that we have regulatory bodies. It is not the Department of Education who determines salary rates. Our teachers, our employees are classified according to grades. 
and you are paid your salary according to the grade that you are in. And so we have instances, and I can cite them to you, of engineers moving over to the Department of Education to teach mathematics, and it is good for us. We have instances of nurses, of artists moving over to the Department of Education. An economist one does not get as high as a teacher one in the Department of Education because of the regulatory um, <clears throat> rules of our regulatory agencies. And these are the Civil Service Commission and the Department of Budget and Management. Our Secretary of Education cannot just say, well, we will pay our one million teachers this much because there are others who are also serving the government and serving the Filipino people. The next chart will show you, in addition to the basic salaries, and this was during the last administration, the benefits and allowances that are provided for in the 2022 budget aside from the basic salaries. You have PERA of 2000, you have the clothing allowance, you have the mid-year bonus, you have the special hardship allowance, you have the honoraria for teaching overload. World Day Teachers Incentive was started by the uh, previous, immediately previous Secretary of Education. During World Teachers Day, they get 1,000. Ah, 1,000 lang, but then if you have 900,000 teachers to take care of, that is already 910 million. <coughs> Year end bonus, representation allowance, and so on. Two pages of additional benefits, which most of which were allotted to teachers. But the best news, and I'm sure our Secretary of Education will be very pleased with this, before the salary grades of teachers were only up to teacher three. But now, the Executive Secretary just before he, he left, or, or not really left, before he, he um, um, retired from his office, approved additional grades. So you, a teacher does not have to wait for the person who is higher than he is to either pass on to another dimension or to, to go to heaven or wherever it is that he is destined for, or to retire or to get an accident because there are now four additional grades which will allow a teacher, if he is hard work, he or she is hard working, to move up without waiting for the next person who is above you. So from teacher one to teacher three, this was recently approved, we now have teacher four, teacher five, to th teacher six, and teacher seven. And a master teacher five will get range 22 at 69,000 pesos. And this is uh, perhaps a very significant, uh, shall we say, retirement going away gift of the office of the president, uh, Rodrigo Roa Duterte, whose mother was a teacher grandmother of our Secretary of Education. We also ensured that no one is left behind. I realized, coming from one of the poorest provinces in the country, that we still have schools, one-room schools, which are located in very remote geographical areas and will not really attract those who are trying to attract votes maybe one room with 10 pupils, maybe a school with only two, three, or four teachers, with very, very uh, meager facilities. And so we are addressing this, and we call it, this was initiated by the Department of Education, and we call it the last mile schools, because we were already nearing the end of our term when we made an inventory of this, what we now call last mile schools. And this was strongly supported by the president and also by our international partners. 
And we also ensured that those who are out of school, what my predecessor used to describe as those falling through the cracks of the educational system because they cannot make it, they have to get out. They have to work or some have very early marriages and so on. And so we have given them a second chance to pursue education. I don't need to brief our beloved Secretary of Education on this because she herself, her city has been uh, supporting programs for girls, programs for youth who are in prison so that they can continue their schooling. And we have more than doubled the enrollment of out-of-school youth and reaching now 4,087,849 students. But what, and I'm very, very happy that our Secretary of Education has indicated an interest in this program. It's a very small program, we're just starting it. It's education futures. What will society be like 30, 50, 100 years from now? What kinds of jobs are we preparing our learners for? Do they have to take up medicine? Do they have to take up physical therapy or, or laboratory? When you can just strap a gadget to a, a person's body and you already know the results of his lab test and already you are advised to, to do whatever needs to be done. We have to think of what future society will be like beyond elections, beyond perhaps even our own lifetimes so that we reduce the fear, the uncertainty that not only our students suffer from and are exposed to, but also our teachers and their parents and our communities. We call it an education's futures program. What society will be like? What will jobs be like? Will it mean anything to spend how many years studying medicine or engineering or physical uh, therapy when gadgets will already have been developed to do much of the work that we usually train people for years and years. And also the impression which has been spread all over the world that the Philippines stopped education that the Philippines closed its schools. No. And we have repeatedly cited figures, etc. When the former president declared a lockdown, this was in March. Taman Tama Bakasyon. This was followed by two months of vacation. And therefore, of course, schools were closed. It was summer vacation when the lockdown occurred. And then we decided to open schools in August, and the president was not yet sure that we had a handle on COVID. And so we opened school in October. For the past two years, the other year we opened in October, this year we opened in September, and this coming academic school year, we will open in August. And perhaps it is important to be aware that Congress has passed a law empowering the president to determine when schools should be open. And so we also moan and groan about the quality, not only of education in the Philippines, but also the quality of people we send abroad to work. If you will recall our history, the decision to allow to send Filipinos abroad to work was triggered, of course, by the massive and the huge debt crisis and the economic crisis at that time. And it's not as if education has to be blamed for the so-called menial jobs that are being uh, done by Filipinos. But all of you know because clearly all of you here in this hall are educated. You know 
that we have scientists working all over the world. Believe it or not, we have a space scientist in NASA, and he is a true blue Boholano. And if you speak to him, you will know immediately that he is Boholano and that he is Messiah, and he is a scientist. During the last awarding ceremonies for uh, the 10 outstanding young men, you have young men involved working in laboratories. You have young inventors, babae pamanden. I will not say babae pamanden, I apologize. I say a girl scientist, a girl inventor getting a TOYM award. And also our children are winning in scientific contests. Of course, we always win in dance contests. We always win in beauty contests. We always are so lovable in singing contests. But perhaps we have not noticed that we are producing scientists ourselves, doing not mental jobs for meager salaries. And in 2018, for example, the second grant award went to Camarines National High School, a team of students from the Philippine Science High School. In 2018, we had, um, we had um, uh, students from the Iloilo National High School. And believe it or not, these kids discovered each of them asteroids, you know, all those floating things. And these were named after them. These are Filipino high school kids who are very competitive in science and who regularly win contests. In 2019, we also had from Angeles City Science High School. In 2022, we won in the Simeo 12th Regional Congress search for young scientists. We are not only good in dancing, we're very good in singing, and we're very artistic as a people, but we are also producing young scientists who we are not, who we are preparing not for mental, uh, menial jobs. And then in Britannica's Young Shapers of the Future in 2022 from Iloilo National High School. We laugh about the accents of the science, but how come they're very, very good in math? And but these are boring things to be told that we are winning awards left and right. And so what is, what is more interesting to us are those Marjona Bayon uh, jokes, which, were, which is a source of so much delight, laughter, and derision. And you know, Secretary, what I did, I asked our research team to look to examine contests involving high school kids, young people in other countries, in Europe, in US, and Australia, and find out what these kids, how these kids answer questions. One of the questions asked from a great continent, of a student from a great continent, known for all the discoveries in science was, what is the animal which has a um, um, ink, black ink, in its neck toward of uh, predators. Ang sagot ng bata from this great country of scientists and inventors, the owl. And then there was another question in another uh, uh, contest. That the child was asked, by the way, European ito ha, who painted Mona Lisa? Ang sabi ng bata with great confidence, of course, Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> this is in a foreign country. And people laugh about it and forget about it. But here in the Philippines, it is as if we already have a huge crisis 
because a child who is educated abroad does not know which highway is located in what island uh, in the Philippines. And before the previous administration, the president himself was very upset because in the one of my favorite films, of course, General Luna, uh, one kid was asking, why is Apollinario Mabini sitting all the time? In the film, he was sitting all the time. And the president at the time was also very upset. We get very upset over entertainment shows, but we don't notice the achievements of our young people in science and in the art. You name it, we are very competitive, but perhaps it is not noticed at all. Since we don't notice it, therefore the world does not notice it also. Therefore the international agencies don't notice these matters as well. Another initiative which we also started is the focus secretary on the youth. We have been taking care as much as we can for our teachers, but we have to strengthen, I believe, our youth program. And I'm very happy that you are interested also in subjects other than mathematics, engineering, or chemistry, or accounting. But they have to be taught citizenship. They have to be taught love of the country. They have to be taught to defend their rights against invaders. My mother, she was also a teacher. Each June 12, when there is a parade, she would weep when, he would, when she would see these young people marching. Because during World War II, of course, none of you were born during World War II, as I was born during World War II. The first defenders of the, our country against the foreign invaders were those who were trained in ROTC and in PMT and in citizenship because they could be rounded up very, very fast. I know from the experience, for example, of my own province. And so I'm very, very happy that uh, uh, the secretary has an interest in fostering um, citizenship, in fostering loyalty to the country as well to our history. And finally, for the first time, because we think from one administration to another. We think from one election to another and base our plans on this. While other countries were having their long-term development plans as early as the 1970s, we would always plan only for three years in anticipation of changes in the political, the social, and the economic environment. And for the first time, we have developed a long-term plan. Because when you have a long-term plan, perhaps our fears, our nightmares, our terrors for our children, our teachers, and our communities will probably be transformed into a sense of excitement, a sense of discovery, a sense of a wonderful world, what Shakespeare describes as a brave new world waiting for our learners and waiting for the new generation. And so, as we turn over the Department of Education, um, Secretary of Finance used to say that DepEd has the biggest army, Secretary Sara, in the, the biggest army in, in the entire bureaucracy bigger than the military, bigger than any of the big in, uh, departments because the Constitution says so and we remain faithful to it. And so, even as there is much finger pointing, even as there is much moaning and groaning, finally, I have always been told that we are only equal to Djibouti. Djibouti is uh, an African Arab country. And I finally met the Minister of Education in, in London. 
and he made a presentation. And I was surprised. I spoke in English. He spoke in French and demanded a translator to translate his French into English. And obviously, he did not look. I was thinking of somebody in G-strings jumping up and down with feathers in his head. But you have a very urbane person. Sometimes, the kind of news, news we tell about ourselves, the kind of information that we give international communities and donors also are reflective of the kind of divisiveness, the kind of disunity, the kind of anger that we foster against each other. And therefore, Secretary Sara, and I have grown very fond of you. Maybe it's because of your grandparents, your great-grandparents. Maybe uh, it's because I see you as kind and gentle and caring for children, for the young of Davao. And I believe that you will take care of the young of the Philippines. We have to start basic. Don't wait for university. Don't wait for PhD. By that time, it will be too late. And therefore, Secretary Sara, we in the Department of Education, we are not ashamed. We are not embarrassed. And we are turning over to our beloved Secretary of Education, Vice President Sara Z. Duterte, an organization which has persevered in spite of, and perhaps because of, COVID-19. An organization which developed new initiatives, new ways, and I, this I told you, UNESCO and UNICEF, we did not wait for you to come in and offer help because the situation is urgent. We raised funds by ourselves. We found solutions by ourselves. And we will share such experiences with the other country. And so we are turning over to you, not an institution which is a cause of embarrassment, an embarrassment which we created for ourselves. We are turning over to you an institution which has persevered, which has survived, and I am very sure will help create a great future for our learners. And so in closing, uh, my staff is already very nervous because 20 minutes lang daw ang allowed. Uh, namimiligro na yung aking 20 minutes. Uh, and since I'm no longer their boss, they can tell me off uh, <laughs> and send all those cards and signs and textbooks. So um, I'd like to end with, um, with a uh, quote. Uh, from my favorite book. And all of you recognize this, of course. And this is from Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes was referred always in earlier versions of the Holy Book as teacher. Ecclesiastes was a teacher. But actually, many also suspect that Ecclesiastes was written by uh, King Solomon. And he said, for everything, there is a season, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to love, a time to hate, a time to build, a time to destroy. And I say also, a time to do one's work and also a time to move on so that others can continue a time for every purpose under heaven. Another favorite quote, I'm, I apologize because I'm fond of quoting from the good book, Sabine in St. Paul to Timothy, in his letter to Timothy, <clears throat> because he had illness in St. Paul. Sabine, and this is the title of the book 
of the biography of Quezon, Manuel Quezon, the good fight. Sabi niya, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And this is what we are turning over with great confidence, with great joy, and with a promise of cooperation, a promise of, of working together continually in the fields of education from Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And now it is the turn of our beloved Secretary of Education to accept the responsibility. Parang graduation, ano? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And also, my Muli, maraming maraming salamat kalihim Leonor Magtolis Briones sa lahat po ng ating learning gains sa panahon man ng pandemya. Tunay nga po na nasaksihan ng buong mundo ang resilience ng Pilipino sa inyong pamumuno. Paalam man, ngunit maraming maraming salamat. Bigyan natin ng masigabong palakpakan. Ang outgoing Secretary, Leonor Magtolis Briones. Ipinahatid po ng mga kawanin ang kagawaran ng edukasyon ang lubos naming pasasalamat sa inyong paglilingkod sa sektor ng edukasyon, ang inyong paggabay sa pinakamalaking ahensya sa pamahalaan ang nagbigay ng magandang kinabukasan sa mga kabataang Pilipino. Maraming maraming salamat po, Kalihim Briones.